Okay, we're just a, a minute past three o'clock, uh, but we'd like to welcome you all to uh, today's webinar. Uh, this is the form webinar series, and my name is Shaw Sprague. I am the Vice President of Government Relations at the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome everybody here to our webinar which is going to focus on a, a summer federal advocacy with a focus on conducting in-district site visits. Uh, we have some great info to relay uh, from a really outstanding panel. I think you're gonna enjoy today's conversation. Uh, before we get started, however, there are a few notes uh, about the presentation today. Uh, first, we'll take questions uh, from the audience during the webinar, uh, but please do send those questions via the Q&A function, not through the chat. Uh, Q&A is preferable. Uh, you can submit those at any point, but we will take up the questions at the end of the presentations. So um, uh, feel free to submit those. And in the meantime, please do use the chat function to communicate uh, with participants. The closed captioning function is also enabled for this webinar. Uh, you can enable it and disable it either through the controls at the bottom uh, of your Zoom screen or through your audio settings. Uh, and following the program, we will be sending out the recording uh, of today's webinar as well as the shared resources directly uh, to the email that you use to register. Uh, and finally, all the Preservation Leadership Forum webinars are uh, archived in our Forum webinar library, so make sure to take advantage of that resource uh, uh, going forward. Uh, next slide, please. So as the uh, roadmap for today, uh, we're going to hear from five speakers, uh, and after that, you'll have an opportunity to ask them uh, questions through the Q&A. Uh, we'll first give a quick update uh, on legislative delay in Washington and the uh, quick roadmap ahead. Uh, we'll cover in-district tour tours, communicating with congressional staff, uh, an example of, of site visit uh, from the field, and we're excited to be able to share a congressional viewpoint uh, on site visits and their importance uh, from, from Hill staff. Uh, in terms of the uh, roadmap, uh, we're now 133 days from the midterm elections, uh, and there is a lot in flux in Washington. So against the backdrop of the midterm elections, which tends to favor uh, the party not in uh, power, we're seeing Washington grapple with major Supreme Court rulings the January 6th committee, the war in Ukraine, record setting inflation and ongoing global pandemic. So all of which have the potential but to become a driving issue come November. So uh, a very dynamic situation. Uh, but what we're starting to see now is Washington uh, switch its focus from major advancing major policy uh, initiatives to more uh, uh, focus on winning elections. Uh, so the window for major legislative uh, movement uh, will, will uh, slow uh, until after the elections when we, when we enter that lame duck session, which uh, really is, is a bit unpredictable as to what the dynamic might be in a lame duck session, but that presents probably uh, a potential flurry of legislative activity before the end of the 117th Congress. Uh, the um, opportunity though we have today, uh, we look forward to, to getting to our panel is that uh, the historic preservation field has a number of opportunities through uh, to advance policy priorities like securing strong funding for the Historic Preservation Fund and advancing legislation to improve the historic tax credit uh, through um, the uh, August recess period, uh, which is the in-district period when members are back home. And we look forward to having a conversation about how to take advantage of that and what you can do to uh, set in motion good, good visits uh, that'll be particularly impactful as we try to position our historic preservation priorities 
for, for uh, the legislative opportunities for the remainder of this Congress. So uh, an in-person visit to a historic site, a main street or a stack historic tax credit project is one of the most effective ways to convey the importance and impact of our work. And it's my pleasure now to turn it over to my colleague, Renee Coleman. Renee is the Senior Director of Outreach and Support at the National Trust. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Renee. Well, thanks, I really appreciate that. Um, one of the things that I usually say is that if a picture is worth a thousand words, then a site visit is worth 10,000. Um, so I think this is one of the most effective ways that you can advocate uh, for your preservation priority. So we're excited to share some tips with you today. Next slide. Um, we have a couple of great examples up here that I wanted to share with you all. Um, this is the former mayor on the right of Boston, um, and they had a program called Mayor on Main Street. Um, and this is where the mayor would get on a trolley um, with his cabinet department heads. They would depart City Hall um, and they would visit uh, about 12 award recipients from the Boston Main Street program. Uh, and they would have these stops over three days. So it gave them an opportunity to showcase to the mayor exactly the work of the main streets and um, the advocacy asks that they had. They, as you can see, they're right next to the mayor and heads of departments, um, as well as his cabinet. So it was a great opportunity for them to directly advocate uh, about their priorities at the local level. And then on the left, you'll see um, a great example of a, an advocate who we awarded uh, the John H. Chafee Award for Public Policy because Heritage Ohio has done such outstanding work um, both at the local level as well as the state level and federal level in terms of advocacy. And here you see uh, the former director and other um, Heritage Ohio board members and staff uh, with Representative David Joyce advocating for the historic tax credit. So these are just a couple of examples of how you can use this great tool. Uh, next slide. Oh, sorry, went back one. Um, we are attaching a handout for you that will give you uh, a couple of uh, specific things that you need to do. Um, and these are some tips that we've learned the hard way and things that will help you. Um, first of all, you need to decide which preservation project in your area offers the most bang for buck. Um, for example, there are some uh, sites that you might have under rehabilitation that you want to show uh, construction underway. You might have projects that you're hoping that if you did get federal dollars that you could rehabilitate. Um, you might have other needs at the state, like say you're going to try to get a state historic tax credit and you want to try to show the benefit um, of what a potential project would do if they had state dollars. So you need to come together as a group and decide which are the sites that you're going to, um, to prioritize as showing your, your official. Um, the other one is it helps to have a large body of people, and I know that my colleague Mike Phillips is going to talk about that uh, in addition. The other one is to have a wide range of dates because what we've learned is that actually scheduling these is the hardest thing <laughs> to get accomplished. So having a wide variety of dates in addition to a wide variety of partners is important. Um, and then also to be able to ask, uh, what is it, vote early and vote often, the same thing is that you want to continue asking in terms of making sure that you get, get the answer that you want. And to not be discouraged if you get a staff member and not the actual official, because staff can then convey that information and then hopefully in the future arrange a site visit. One of the things that I think is most important is to actually make the ask. You have to have an ask. It's just like in fundraising, it's great to have all the supporting materials. And I think when you do have the materials, you need to show both statistics as well as the stories of the humans that are actually being impacted by this policy. Um, but actually you have to have somebody there um, 
making a request of the official. So it's not just a time when you're out of the office and everybody's having a great time, but that someone actually does make a request. Finally, you don't have to have all the answers. I do that every day in my job. I don't have a lot of the answers, um, but you always need to promise when you follow up and thank them for the visit uh, with any information that you, that you promised them. Uh, so Mike, I think, is our next uh, person up. And Mike and I have actually done a lot of these visits together. So thanks, Mike. Sure. Thank you, Renee. And it's good to be on this webinar. We've done quite a few site visits, and we have learned uh, what has gone well, what uh, kind of worked, and what really didn't work. So there's a wealth of knowledge. Um, over the years of doing this, I mainly advocate for the historic tax credit. So we've done a number of these and we did a lot of these when uh, tax reform um, was going on. Uh, I'm with National Trust Community Investment Corporation. We are the for-profit subsidiary of the National Trust uh, for Historic Preservation. Um, and just when you're thinking about doing site visits, I think, you know, obviously you have some sort of leadership of someone making these scheduling requests. So someone has taken that on, but you need to ask um, yourself who needs to be involved in order to make this successful. Who are the one or two people that can be your core group that can pull this thing off uh, if no one shows up and it's just the member of Congress um, who can put together the right environment to make the ask, the legislative ask that you have. Um, and so when organizing that team, that might be a developer, obviously you've got to get into a building somehow. Um, it could be, you know, you, so a Main Street director might have a relationship with a developer, but you've got to determine who, uh, who are the core people to get involved, to pull it off. And then once you have that core group established, you can add on to that. Um, and when you add on to that, you think about who are the local stakeholders, you know, that might be a nonprofit that uses, in the case of historic tax credit, um, is looking at rehabbing a historic building for their office or for a purpose of their programs. There might be other developers, there might be accountants, architects, historic architects are, are a good one, preservation consultants. Um, who are the stakeholders for your issue locally, and can you add them in to where they could be a good voice and honestly expertise um, with the particular subject? Uh, I advocate for the Historic Tax Credit Growth and Opportunity Act. There are various provisions within that bill, um, you know, some that were really exciting to developers and then some that are you know, kind of wonky accounting provisions that accountants could really talk about, about projects penciling out and financing gaps, and then coupling that with a developer, discussing how hard and uh, projects are and challenges and the loss of value of the credit over uh, a number of years um, can be really compelling because they're experts in the field, they're invested, they're putting their own blood, sweat, and tears into these projects, they're trying to make them move forward. So you got to determine that core group and then who are who who are the folks that can be the chorus that can make compelling points. But if they don't show up, if they're not there, um, it's not it's not the end of the world. Uh, the, the visit can survive um, within that core group. You need to determine who is speaking and how that will go. I would suggest that, you know, 60 or 70 or even 80 percent of the speaking comes from the core group. And then there is an opportunity for those other folks to speak either at the end, um, at the beginning maybe to introduce themselves and then at the end to discuss just their role uh, and, and the, the provisions that you might be um, seeking. Um, and then Renee mentioned this, but the ask, that's the most important thing. Um, the, the cardinal sin of lobbying is to walk out the door uh, and, and not give your ask. You gotta ask the member of Congress um, you know, what you want them to do. Uh, building relationship is key, but keep that ask in front of them. Ask them to actually do something for you and what you are advocating for. 
Um, and so that's important to work that out of who is going to make the ask. And then I always have what I call a cleanup person. <laughs> and so they're the, the safety valve that if somehow in talking the ask was not presented, they're ready to step in and, and discuss that. Um, and these visits, you know, four, six, eight is usually ideal. Four, six, eight people are usually ideal. Uh, beyond eight, 10, 12, that can get to be a little bit large. Um, and then when you're going around the group, that can kind of take a, take a while sometimes. So I would keep it uh, around eight people, um, you know, between four and eight is, is ideal. Um, you wouldn't want to go beyond probably 10 or 12 uh, folks. Um, just it's a large group going through a building and, and not everybody is having an opportunity to talk. Maybe you have some sort of reception afterwards where a larger group um, comes in. Uh, but just the, having a more intimate conversation is probably ideal um, at some point. And then letting the member of Congress address kind of a larger group um, you know, going through a building with uh, 20, 30 people is, is, is pretty tough. So I'm just talking about strictly the, the actual touring of the site. Um, you know, when it comes to conversations, you can work that out according to your group size and what you have involved. Um, lots of times these are matched up with grand opening of projects or groundbreaking. It's always good to connect members of Congress from the very beginning. Um, to share with them their plans. I mean, it is very compelling for a member of Congress to see a uh, building that has seen better days, um, that is underutilized, that is probably maybe vacant, maybe boarded up, and then they tour that uh, as a groundbreaking, and then they see the site under construction, and then they're at the ribbon cutting and they've been there from the very beginning of the rehab um, of this building. They're invested. Um, and honestly, they, they feel connected to the, to the project and feel like that uh, they are making a difference um, in their community, and they are, if they are helping move um, provisions forward. Um, the last thing I'll talk about, well, first of all, just, you know, work out who communicates, who's going to speak, how you're going to go through the flow. Um, usually introductions are fine, do the tour, and then discuss uh, challenges and the provisions and the ask and let everybody introduce and discuss their connection with the legislation that that you are you're talking about. I will say, though, that you need to have contingency plans. Um, if if something, you know, someone does not show up, if, if the member of Congress cannot make it lots of, you know, many times, I won't say lots of times, but many times uh, busy schedules. Um, make it to where a member of Congress is not able to to show up and they have to cancel. Um, if it is a gr groundbreaking or a ribbon cutting or something like that, or some kind of function for the larger public, the show needs to be able to go on without the member of Congress um, coming. So you need to make sure you have the program set to where the event can survive, even if the member does not show. Now, if it's you know four to six people and they're doing a tour with a member and they cancel, you can work on rescheduling a tour, but if it's associated with a larger event, um, you need to make sure that that event can be successful, even if the member um, is not able to show. Um, and I think Lauren will discuss scheduling, but all of that is part of the um, you know, planning of everything. So work out with that core team. I think that's the most important part. Uh, get your materials uh, ready for what you're going to present to the member of Congress. Doesn't have to be a lot of handouts. One piece of paper is fine, uh, just for to hand to a staff person. Um, but get the core group together uh, and add experts um, to have a conversation that is compelling um, to drive what you're advocating for and to drive the ask. So thanks. I think. We have Lauren next. <laughs> Thanks so much, Mike. Hi, everyone. My name is Lauren Cohen. I'm the Associate Director of Government Relations uh, at the National Trust for Historic Preservation. I'm thrilled to be with you today to talk about this, um, about getting people to come to your uh, in-district meetings, getting elected officials to come to those in-district meetings. Um, you know, a lot of the references that Renee and Mike and I have made so far are directed at 
federal elected officials like your member of Congress or your U.S. senators. Um, but this can be applied to state and local elected elected officials too. So just kind of keep that in mind. Um, but you know, I come to you with uh, the background of a former congressional staffer. So I know what it's like to get these uh, requests to come into the office, either in Washington or the district office, or to have a site visit. So um, you know, I'd like to just kind of go through a little bit about. Uh, what you should do before, during, and after uh, an in-district meeting or in-district site visit. So we can just go to the next slide, please. So work with the scheduler and district director. Get to know these individuals and let them know your priorities well in advance of when you'd like the elected official to visit your site. They can advocate for you to the member of Congress to get a visit on their very, very busy schedule. So you know, keep in mind that there's a lot of demand on the time of these uh, members of Congress. So when they're in the district, they wanna make sure that they are making the most of their schedule, the most of their time. Uh, so, you know, if you get to know the scheduler or the district director, you know, they can um, work to make sure that you are on that schedule um, and not get bumped by another uh, interest group or another, uh, another organization looking to get some of their time. Um, and to that end, be flexible. So have an understanding of when congressional recesses are, like the upcoming month long uh, August recess and offer options for a visit during those recess periods. So for instance, you know, if you're looking at the congressional calendar, don't ask for a visit when you know that they're voting in Washington, DC. Um, ask for visits when they're home for their uh, district work periods is what you often see it called or their state work periods. Um, this is, you know, those recesses are times for them to be in the in the home state in the home district uh, for them to connect with constituents to, you know, hold um, town halls or public forums um, and, and to, you know, make site visits like this. So just be flexible, have some dates in mind, uh, know when they're uh, likely to be home. Sometimes they often uh, or sometimes members of Congress will uh, travel abroad during uh, congressional recesses. So just know, um, you know when those recesses may be and be flexible with several options of a date. Uh, also follow up with the names and affiliations of all of the individuals who will attend the event. Uh, this will make the scheduler's job a lot easier because the member of Congress will always want to know who's going to be attending the event. As Mike said, you know, try to keep those groups uh, kind of small if it's a if it's a tour if it's like a big you know ribbon cutting or public event uh, you obviously you know don't know all of the people who are going to be at that public event but um, definitely let the congressional staff know uh, who that core group is the names their titles affiliations that'll be really really helpful for them also work with the communications director or press secretary in the office. Uh, let these staffers know the visit is confirmed and give them details ahead of time so they're ready with press releases or social media posts um, and other kinds of communications they may wanna do. It's also a really smart courtesy to give them notice on any op-eds that you or your group might want, might want to uh, submit or any press releases that you'll be writing so that they're prepared uh, to be able to share that as well. Uh, remember, you're working with these offices toward a goal. You're not opposing these offices. So you're trying to work hand in hand with these offices to make this a really good visit for both parties, for you and for the elected official. Uh, so giving them a lot of advance notice is gonna be really, really helpful and very appreciated. Uh, also before the visit, sign up for office communications and social media. This will make it really easy for you know, while you're on the visit, if you want to quickly share a photo or tag, you know, the, the member's um, social media account, uh, it'll make it really easy for you to do that. And also any office communications, you know, they may announce, you know, I'll be at this ribbon cutting this weekend or something like that. So you're able to share that on your channels as well. Lastly, before the visit, do your homework. Um, know what committees the member of Congress serves on. So do they serve on the Veterans Affairs Committee? Talk about how the site or project serves veterans in the community. Do they serve on the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee? Point out public transit stops near your site. Or, you know, does the member of Congress have a child who's active in the theater department at school? Well, make that connection with them when you're 
at a historic theater or an arts venue that you're talking about. Uh, knowing details about the member of Congress will really, really help you make that personal connection. And really what these office, uh, these uh, in-district site visits are all about is continuing to create a relationship with these decision makers so that when you do have an ask, uh, they're more willing to listen to you, to take you very, very seriously, to know that you are uh, a trusted entity in their district, in their community, and as a constituent. So this is all about building that relationship with both the elected official and with their staff. We can move on to uh, talk about during the visit. So be sure to take photos and use social media. As I mentioned before, uh, members of Congress love having photos taken out in the wild, so to speak. So be sure to take and post photos of your team uh, with the member during the visit. Uh, have a good mix of candid and posed photos. You'll see some later, you've already seen a few um, that Renee shared. Um, tag the appropriate accounts so everyone sees it and sees that it was a great visit and then they can repost it. Um, these photos will also be excellent for you know, future newsletters or board communications you may have or any future interactions you might have with that member of Congress as well. Also during the visit, tell authentic stories. This can be your dedicated time to tell compelling and authentic stories about the site, about the community impact, and about what's at stake, because you're going to come in with an ask shortly. So tell those authentic stories. Also use reliable data. Uh, Mike just mentioned this, but be prepared with important information like job creation or tax revenue or any other pertinent figures. Again, this will reinforce the legitimacy of your advocacy ask and show that you are someone who can be trusted, um, as someone who can be trusted to make an ask like you're making. Uh, and that, uh, that will mean that that member of Congress and their staff will wanna go back to you again and again if they have questions about you know, historic tax credits or the historic preservation fund or anything else that the, about the work that you're doing uh, in the community that you serve. Um, because you're their constituents. Also, make the advocacy ask. Uh, I can't stress this enough, and you've already heard Renee and Mike stress this too, but third time's a charm, I'll say it again. Um, so many people plan wonderful meetings and visits with members of Congress, and they do all the right things, and they never make the ask. Always make an ask. <laughs> um, Increased appropriations funding for Historic Preservation Fund or co-sponsoring of the Historic Tax Credit legislation, whatever it is, do not let the visit end without making that ask. So uh, as Mike mentioned, have that point person that's going to be the one that always remembers to come in with that ask. And something I also really like to tell uh, advocates is don't stop until you get a yes. Now this of course means respectfully, <laughs> um, but you know, if, if a member of Congress or the staff is reluctant to commit to the ask that you've made, have a backup way for them to support you. So if they're not ready to commit to co-sponsoring legislation, perhaps that was your ask, if they're not ready to commit to that, ask if they'll sign a dear colleague letter that you're gonna tell them about that may be floating around at that time. Uh, if they're not ready to sign on to a dear colleague letter, ask them to join the Historic Preservation Caucus uh, in the House. Um, you know, if they're not willing to do that, continue on asking for other things that they may say yes to. You could ask them if you can follow up with the office in, you know, two or three months to update them on what you and your team have been doing. Um, there's no way they're not going to say yes to that. So ending a meeting with some kind of yes, even if it's an easy yes, leaves a positive impression in their mind and shows that you're willing to work with them and meet them where they are. Uh, maybe they just need more information. Maybe they need a little bit more evidence um, to support the ask that you're making. Uh, it also shows that you're persistent and you'll work to turn them into a champion for your advocacy goals. Uh, and then the last slide after the visit, always send a thank you note. Handwritten thank yous go a long way, especially in this uh, deeply, deeply digital world we live in. Uh, so consider sending one specifically to the member of Congress at their district office. Um, know that physical mail takes two to three weeks extra to be delivered to members of Congress because it has to be screened uh, for security purposes. So just know that. But a handwritten note, um, they're increasingly rare. So that's a nice thing to send. Um, but definitely send email thank yous to all the staff that you worked with as well. Remember, as I said before, you're building relationships with the staff too. 
uh, include follow-up materials and photos that you've taken during the visit. Um, those are always really nice things, both um, both uh, in physical mail and, and definitely in, in uh, email as well. Uh, and keep the staff up to date on any activities that you talked about during your visit. Um, you know, if you mentioned something's going to open in a month or this project, um, you know, is going to, we're going to have a walkthrough for this other project in three months. Keep them up to date about that. If you've talked about legislation and you told them um, that you would let them know if other co-sponsors join that legislation, definitely let them know because that might encourage them to get their boss onto that piece of legislation. Um, and then lastly, check in to see if they've taken action on any of your advocacy goals. Again, this is really, really easy just to do a quick email check-in with that staff. Um, it, the more they see your name in their inbox, again, in a respectful way, um, you know, the more that they're going to remember, oh, I remember talking to Mike um, a month ago, and here's Mike emailing again. He's checking in on this. Let me try to get him some more information, whatever that is. Um, so now I'd like to bring in uh, Christina Cannon. She's the executive director of Skowhegan Main Street in Skowhegan, Maine, for her hands-on experience with in-person elected official visits. Thanks, Lauren. <clears throat> and I have a bit of a cold, so I hope you all can hear me okay. <clears throat> so uh, as Lauren said, I'm the executive director of Main Street Skowhegan. Um, we are one of Maine's 10 nationally accredited Main Street communities here in Maine. And Skowhegan is located in central Maine, and we have about 8,200 people. Uh, so, and I often get requests to give tours for legislators. And uh, I typically will lead tours um, regardless, or I always will lead tours regardless of party affiliation. Um, the particular uh, specific example that I, I want to share, it comes from the fall of 2020. Um, and uh, I was contacted by the National Trust for Historic Preservation and the National Main Street Center, as well as our um, main coordinating program to give a tour for uh, Senator Susan Collins. Senator Collins is our Senator in District 2 up in uh, the northern part of Maine, and uh, she's also a senior member of the Appropriations Committee. So um, when I was asked to do this, I said yes. Um, even though it fell during a particularly busy time for me, uh, we were actually uh, in the midst of COVID, of course, and I was trying to figure out how we were going to continue to fundraise without actually having events. And uh, so we were putting together a, a brew bag with some craft beer in it, and uh, we were selling them, and I was supposed to be delivering or handing out brew bags on the day of the tour. But uh, I said yes. Um, because that's uh, one of my mottos in my position as a Main Street director, say yes to things, to opportunities that come your way, because you never know what's going to happen. Um, so I said yes, and uh, we met um, as a team via Zoom, uh, the folks from the National Trust and uh, National Main Street Center, and we talked about uh, the specific goals of the process um, and what, what the whole point of giving the tour to Senator Collins was about. Um, the goals at that time were share specifics about historic preservation projects in our downtown and the importance of those projects and uh, obviously the importance of the Main Street program as well. So um, as part of this tour, I was also asked to share information about some of the projects that we're working on in Skowhegan as well. So after we met as a team via Zoom, I was put in touch with one of uh, Senator Collins' staffers, and uh, he came up to visit Skowhegan, and we did a dry run of the tour. We actually walked the whole tour. I, I went over my talking points, um, and we timed it out to see if it was going to fit into the, the time that we had. I had already been given the amount of time, so I kind of timed it accordingly, and then we did the walkthrough. Um, and then we stayed in touch after that until the day of the actual tour. So um, if there was any questions, I was able to answer them and that sort of thing. Um, and then the day of the tour, um, it was really just a conversation with Senator Collins and I. Uh, she had uh, a bunch of people with her. And of course, there were several community leaders um, and others who attended, as well as uh, Shaw from uh, the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Um, and so, but it was just really us having a conversation and I was able to share with her all of the talking points um, and all of the projects that we're working on in our downtown. In addition to the tour, we actually also did a little meet and greet at the end at a, at a local restaurant, a little patio outside where we were able to, to share um, where she was able to meet some other community leaders. So um, 
one of the things that I was excited about sharing with her was uh, a couple of um, goals for our strategic plan or from our strategic plan and the vision, vision for the future of Skowhegan. So we are actually working on uh, building a river park in our downtown. And so if you've ever been to Salida, Colorado or um, uh, Boise, Idaho, for instance, uh, these communities have these great river parks where you actually can surf or kayak right on a, a, a constructed wave right in a, either a community or in a river um, somewhere near a community. And so uh, we are, this is a picture here of a, a rendering of what our future river park will look like. And uh, we will have, you can see there's um, a, a wave feature at the top that's going to be a static wave for kayaking. And then the second riffle below is actually going to be an adjustable wave feature for river surfing. Um, in addition to the river park, you can uh, see to the right, there is um, going to be a riverfront promenade with viewing areas. And uh, we're also planning for an estimated 50 miles of trails that will be um, adjacent uh, to the river park and accessible via our downtown. So I was able to share all of this. We actually walked out onto the walking bridge and um, and then the, the group that we met with at the end of the tour talked about this project. They talked about the great collaboration happening in Skowhegan, uh, our strong partnerships, our partnerships with the town and the, the municipality. And we were really able to tell the story of Skowhegan and the work that's happening and the importance of our main street and importance of the historic preservation, but also other projects that we're leading. And, um, so after the tour, uh, we stayed in. I stayed in touch with uh, her staffer, Mark Winter, and we built a relationship. Um, and we still uh, talk today um, whenever we see each other out. Um, but there was an opportunity that came up about six to eight months later. Um, the earmark, the new opportunity to apply for an earmark or a congressionally designated spending. Um, fund. And so we actually submitted to Senator Collins um, a request for a $2 million earmark to fund, um, to help fund our river park project. And uh, we were very lucky because we actually got that $2 million. Um, we just learned about it back in March. It was a nearly a full year of waiting to hear back. Um, but Mark would call me and, and let me know where we were at with the process with the appropriations bill and, and how it was moving forward. And uh, so we submitted actually to Senator Collins and Senator King, our other senator in Maine, and uh, both of them worked to push it through. But I really stayed in touch locally or like mostly with Senator Collins and um, they were really champions for the project. Um, and actually Senator Collins gave me a personal phone call um, to let me know about the about the $2 million earmark. So it was uh, a hugely important um, step towards completion of this project. And um, we wouldn't be as far along without this, of course, $2 million earmark. Um, so we're really excited about it. And it just goes to show what happens when you say yes to an opportunity, uh, you, sh you put your best foot forward when you give a tour to, um, to anyone that you're giving a tour to, but particularly uh, legislators, and um, saying yes to things, it's it's really important to take opportunities when you can, uh, when when you have them fall on your lap, actually. <laughs> so uh, so yeah, it was a it was a great opportunity, and um, so yeah, that's that's my story. Christina, that's that's great. Thank you for that, and congratulations uh, again on, on having the vision for the project and uh, taking advantage of those opportunities. Uh, so next, we'll we'll see if uh, Maggie Ward is uh, on the webinar with us. She is the legislative director for Representative Turner from Ohio. Uh, um, Representative Turner is the chair, uh, co-chair of the Historic Preservation Caucus in the House and longtime supporter of historic preservation. So we certainly appreciate all he's done through his many years of, of leadership. And uh, we're very pleased to have Maggie, uh, hopefully with us today, who can, who can speak to the, uh, from the staffing point of view of the importance of these, these site visits. So let me pause there and see if Maggie has been able to join us. Yep. I'm on. Thanks, Shaw. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, as Shaw said, I am Congressman Turner's legislative director. Um, Congressman Turner is the co-chair of the House Historic Preservation Caucus. And 
in his capacity as his legislative director. I oversee um, all of his domestic policy portfolio with historic preservation being included. Um, and so I have not only staffed him for um, our historic preservation related visits in Dayton, but also in DC. Um, and I thought Christina really hit the nail on the head um, in making these visits effective when she talked about um, how she was prepping with staff beforehand um, and then talked about how um, she was able to get an earmark out of it. Um, I think what's really important to do is staff, I mean, generally across all offices, um, prep their boss before they do these types of visits. Um, and so that looks like, you know, telling them like what they're planning to talk about. Um, so letting us know, like, if there's any legislative nexus between um, the visit um, and any goals that that your group has is super important. So we can flag it for our boss ahead of time and then they can bring it up to you while they're visiting. Um, and, it, and it gives them a really good opportunity not only to have context when they're speaking with you about this, but then afterwards when um, there's a related piece of legislation on the floor, we can say, oh, hey, wait, we had a conversation with a group about this. Let's go talk to them again. Um, so that I always think is wildly important. Um, and then when the legislator is there at the visit, um, bringing up those legislative asks, um, even if it's, you know, additional funding, if it's sponsoring a bill, if it's a reauthorization of a heritage area, um, all of those are really important to bring up because members and their staff um, are paying attention to a thousand different issues all at once. So making sure that um, you're in their ear about it. And I think if the member is out visiting your site, you're already more than halfway there, right? Like they're interested in the topic, they're interested in your group um, and really displaying that nexus between your group and what they as legislators, um, specifically for us at the federal level can do is really important um, because it makes it easier for the member and the staff when you just lay it out. Um, and you guys are the experts, right? Like, you know the most about all of this stuff. So I think those are the two most helpful things um, in making those site visits effective and then also follow up. So um, if and when you have your legislative ask and then three months later you see that it's on the floor or that it's moving through committee, follow up with the staff and the member um, because it shows that one, you really did care about this visit. It keeps the relationship going. Then it also just helps us out. Um, like I, I'm even thinking like last week, a couple of groups flagged different policies for us that the Congressman had supported, but that I hadn't been um, totally paying attention to because there was something else huge happening last week, right? So continuing that dialogue even after the site visit, I think is also effective in making sure that whatever goals or ideas you talked to the member or the senator or their staff about um, really follow through with them. It, it's, it's super helpful um, and it definitely builds that level of trust and dialogue and shows us that you remembered what we talked about and that, and that you know, um, you're doing a go good job tracking that. It's, it's always super helpful for us because there's like, you know, so many different things going on. Um, but yeah, I think those are like the three biggest things is, um, you know, making those goals clear, the follow up, and then um, preemptively letting staff know what um, sort of legislative nexus w exists between the site visit and the member um, is super helpful. So thank you. Maggie, thank you so much for making time and providing some, some really good insights. Um, always so helpful to for folks to understand how busy uh, uh, legislative staff are and uh, and some of the tips for for uh, maintaining that relationship going going forward and how quickly um, how, how many constituents you're meeting with on a daily basis and how how many issues are popping up so. Uh, you really can't expect staff to uh, remember, and so it's it's incumbent on you to to uh, keep that issue visible for for staff. So, uh, Maggie, thanks for for emphasizing that point. Uh, so now we're going to turn to the uh, Q and A portion. Um, we've got a few 
uh, questions teed up, but I thought um, perhaps I'd, I'd start with uh, one for Maggie. Um, um, you know, we, we, we're focused on district staff uh, a little bit here. Christina was working with district staff. Um, and, uh, and of course, it's, it's great to connect with district staff. They are the eyes and ears on the ground and um, do provide legislative staff with, with um, you know, updates and priorities from, from in district. Uh, but Maggie, maybe you can speak to a little bit of the dynamic between, between district staff and ledge staff and, and how you get uh, legislative staff out to, to site visits if, if the member is not available. Uh, how, often, how often do ledge staff get, get uh, to take a tour in district? Um, okay, that's a great question. It definitely varies from office to office. Um, so I personally work very closely with our district staff and um, a lot of, you know, some of our legislative ideas manifest out of meetings that our district staff takes and they're saying, hey, we keep hearing this or hey, like we've had so many like casework issues with this. And then it, it manifests itself into a legislative ask, but getting ledge staff out to a district state to visit. Um, normally what I do is um, I feel like I'm back in Dayton maybe once a quarter, if not more. And I just keep a running list of meetings I've taken or places that I know I need to go. So honestly, like half of it, I feel like sometimes is just inviting the um, ledge staffer out or making it a point to say like, you, you need to see this in person, like in order for you to understand everything. I've like really, really conceptualize everything I've just told you. Um, so that's, that's at least what I do and I notice the practice in our offices. Um, I would assume most other offices are pretty similar, um, but I, I definitely can't attest to it. And I know, um, and I don't know if the dynamic between district staff and ledge staff in all offices is the same. Um, I would definitely say ours is pretty good. We work very closely with each other. Thank you, that's great. Uh, we have a question uh, that's come in. Uh, I think this could be answered by, by multiple folks on the panel. Um, but what talking points do you find the most impactful between data, economic stats, jobs, et cetera, versus human driven stories? Uh, and you know, does it depend on which elected official you are speaking with? Uh, I will, I will frame it and then uh, give somebody a chance to jump in here. Um, uh, but I, I think both, both those uh, talking points are important. I think each visit should probably have both uh, prepared to be most effective. Um, but let me pause there and just see if, if some of the experts uh, wanna, wanna jump in uh, to help answer. Well, I, I think we... We all could probably jump in and, you know, yes, yes, and yes. I think um, <laughs> uh, the economics uh, to which you can explain are, are positive, the jobs numbers, everybody's looking for jobs number, job numbers. And then also the um, human driven stories bring a, you know, in a personal um, connection to um the visit. So I would say all of the above. Sometimes not all of those can be produced, but what you can produce and you're, I like the way you're thinking and you're thinking the right way and amplify um, all of those to whatever extent you can. But I'm, Renee and Lauren probably have some thoughts too. Yeah, I know. I, I think that's exactly right. Try to try to blend those elements as well as you can. Uh, it does depend, you know, it can it can depend on the member of Congress, the elected official, the staffer that you're meeting with, um, how hard you need to lean on one or the other. But having a blend is, is always, the you know, the right formula, I think. Um, it also depends on the ask you're making as well. So, you know, if your ask really is, can you join the Historic Preservation Caucus? Um, that's not going to need as much like hard, hard data for that kind of ask. If you're talking about, um, you know, signing on to a piece of legislation or, or something like that, that, that might need a, a heavier hand on the, on the data, but 
I, I never ever think you should skimp on those authentic human stories about um, how this work uh, contributes to your communities. Now, I just want to say as a, a preservationist, I think we have the, um, the bonanza of having pictures that are pretty amazing. The before and afters. I've been in offices where people go, oh my gosh, you know. Um, and I've also seen people say, I didn't realize that that place that I go to all the time was rehabilitated with either state or federal tax credits that I didn't realize what made that rehab possible. So I think pictures are a great way to then engage in conversation. Um, I am particularly nervous about numbers. I get really shut down when I see a lot of numbers, but I have also seen people's eyes just light up when they're shown these amazing statistics. And even I can understand graphs and understand where the projection is going. So I do think if you do do numbers, that having a graph is also particularly helpful for those of us who might not be as comfortable in that field. I would also encourage people, because of our preservation background, a lot of us are focused on the building, but it's also important to include pictures with people in them, actually using a building. So it's a it's a shocker, I know, but but having the building in use is important. Thank you, Renee. Uh, we have a question perhaps for Maggie, uh, and I don't know if, if you're familiar with this legislation, but we had a question about the status of the Revitalizing Small and Local Business uh, Business Act. Uh, Maggie, if that's something you worked on, maybe you can share any updates. So I don't know that bill and I don't think, um, the Congressman is a co-sponsor, but, um, I am interested in knowing the bill number so I can look at it now. <laughs> um, but no, and I, I, I don't know if that, if that the name of the bill sounds like it would go through small business, but I don't, I don't know, um, if they're committee has had any markups recently. It is a committee work week, so that could be something they have cooking this week. I just don't know. I'm sorry. No, that's perfectly fine. See, that is how uh, the communication chain works. Somebody asks a question, and the legislative director for Congressman Turner now wants to look up this piece of legislation, so thank you for that question. Um, uh, Gail has a question about local uh, uh, board and town officials and uh, communicating at that local level. Um, um, Renee, do you, do you have some thoughts for best practices on, on maintaining and uh, building a relationship at that, at that local level? Sure, and I'll, I'll then turn it over to Christina. Um, one of the most effective uh, Main Street managers uh, actually won the Great American Main Street Award and had the pleasure of going around uh, with him up on the hill and he carried his heavy metal, <laughs> must have been 20 pound award all around Congress. Um, but he told a great story about local advocacy, which I've always remembered. And that is the power of having a few people with different perspectives weighing in. So he was trying to get money for his Main Street program. They had canceled the money that was coming from the local program, uh, from the city. And so he had people uh, communicate their interest about maintaining this funding. And he had, I think he had only like seven people, but it was different, representing different interests, right? The business owners and uh, the people who had the hotels and all the different aspects. And he got a call from the town manager saying, lay off, there's so many people weighing in. Um, and so even though it was only seven individuals to the person who was receiving him, it felt like a lot. Uh, so I think that's the power of having different perspectives represented. Thanks, Renee. Uh, Christina, yeah. I've been in uh, this role now for our, for six and a half years, and I have probably learned that the most important thing that I can do as a Main Street manager, um, or really I feel like any in any role where you work in the community, is to really uh, put yourself out there and be uh, present in the community. Um, people need to see you doing the work. Um, 
I attend select board meetings on a regular basis, even if I don't always have something that I need to get pushed through the, the board. Um, I attend to just um, provide updates occasionally. I used to do a quarterly update, but I actually go more often than quarterly now. Um, I have a texting relationship with the chair of our select board. I'm good friends with the town manager because I've developed these relationships and we have you know, similar goals and a similar vision for moving the town forward. And so we're able to stay connected and, and really uh, keep a keep in touch to make sure that we're all moving on uh, in the same direction. Um, so similar with other organizations that we collaborate with, uh, whenever we have a new initiative or some new project that we're working on, we invite um, people to the table to join in on the process, to join a committee, um, to join in an advisory role, that sort of thing. So it's always, it's about welcoming people into what you're doing, sharing more information and, um, and really building relationships. Thanks, Christina, that, that's great. Um, being present, uh, you know, I think, I think uh, that's a great point. So uh, we're coming to the top of the hour. So I we'll wanna thank everybody for joining today. Uh, we hope you enjoyed our panel. Uh, you've got a number of experts who've uh, done this for a long time and are passionate about preservation. So, so uh, very glad they could join us. I want to thank the panel. I uh, wanted to provide a few uh, closeout pieces of information for everybody staying up to date. Uh, please uh, continue to share uh, the resources you can find on the National Trust website, including federal advocacy opportunities as they become available. Uh, visit our website, uh, forum.savingplaces.org uh, and, and our social media channels as well. Uh, we also have a government relations advocacy newsletter. If you have not uh, signed up or not receiving that, sign up for it. Um, that's a, a monthly uh, update of things that are happening that month, uh, as well as several ways to take action on those advocacy priorities. Uh, and always keep an eye out for future webinars. We, we try to do these fairly regularly. So please continue to join us for that. Uh, and lastly, uh, we like to emphasize the message, keep talking, uh, talk, talk amongst yourselves, as they say. Uh, Form Connect is uh, our online community, and uh, we review that often and look to that to understand what's happening on the ground and, and with communities uh, working on historic preservation priorities. So please be sure to contribute to that so uh, you can help inform our work at uh, local, uh, state, and national levels. Uh, it is free to op open to everyone, so please take advantage of that. Again, here's our website, forum.savingplaces.org. Uh, if, you, if you type in the hyperlink to webinar, you'll see the upcoming webinars and contact our forum staff who are diligently working behind the scenes today. Uh, feel free to contact them at forum.savingplaces.org. And with that, we will wrap up our webinar. Thank you everybody for, for joining. We look forward to uh, presenting to you again in the future. Uh, and please don't hesitate to, to be in touch uh, with follow-up. Thanks again.